Thank you for joining us for Artist Talk with Sophia Kareem. My name is Arush Shakil and I am the Communications Manager here at South Asia Institute. We are a nonprofit arts organization located in Chicago and we opened our doors in October 2019. Our mission is to amplify South Asian voices and cultivate the arts and culture of South Asia and its diaspora. Today's program is in part with our first virtual exhibition, Diasporic Rhizome which is currently on view through May 15th at diasporicrhizome.com. This exhibition was really conceived out of a need to connect virtually, but mainly to bring together self-identifying South Asian artists who are re-examining our histories, commenting on current social issues, and dreaming of new realities. Sophia Kareem is one of those artists and activists who is creating new narratives. Sophia's practice combines architecture, visual art, and activism. She has practiced architecture for over 20 years in London and New York. Her activism focuses on human rights across Bangladesh and India, campaigning for the release of imprisoned artists. She's the founder of Turbine Bog, which is a joint artist movement that has staged protest exhibitions at Tate Modern or Turbine Hall. She's also been shortlisted for the Jamil Prize, so congratulations on Sophie on this exciting news. Our conversation today will look at the origins of the Turbine Bog movement and how it continues to become a global form of protest. We will be taking questions from the audience towards the end. If you notice on your screen, there is an option for Q&A. We ask that you please submit your questions in this box right here and not the chat. Um, we will get to your questions, like I said, towards the end. Before I begin, um, I wanted to talk about the intersection between art and activism. Terms like activist and protest have become buzzwords in our current media and social media. But what do they actually look like in practice and why is activist art significant in changing the world around us? We know that art moves people and we can look at activism to move the material world. But before we act in the world, we must be moved to act. So art and activism can work together with the emotional effect of art moving us into the action phase to create change. Artists as activists like Sophia take on the role of fostering dialogue, telling stories, building a community, and invite participation to transform the environment, reveal reality, create disruption, and inspire dreaming towards a cultural change. Please join me in welcoming Sophia Kareem. Hi, Hello. Sophia. How are you today? Good, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in this. We're so excited to have you. Um, and I guess I will just jump into my first question, which is, Sophia, can you tell us about the Turbine Bog movement, how it was conceived, your process in creating the art and the public's involvement? Yeah, um, I'm gonna do that in the format of a photo story. Uh, but before I do that, I have to make a very important point about the moment we're in, because I don't think it's possible to talk about the work and what Turbine Bug does without talking about the crisis that we're in at the moment. This is a moment of very deep crisis. Both India and Bangladesh are in the grip of a deadly and catastrophic second wave COVID pandemic. The second wave was entirely predicted, but it's been exacerbated by political and corporate maneuvering. In Bangladesh recently, there has again been the mass exodus of workers, hospitals can't cope, vaccines are running out. They were relying on India as the source. India resembles the Wild West now. I mean, the scenes that I'm seeing look like post-apocalyptic scenes, mass cremations, people dying in hospital car parks, the steels of the crematoriums are buckling due to the heat of incessant burning of corpses, burning, 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 day in, day out. Now, in the recent weeks, the BJP government held mass election rallies because of the upcoming election in West Bengal. They also allowed the Gummala, the um, religious festival, which is known as the world's largest gathering of humans on the planet 
normally it's on a 12 year cycle, it should have been next year. They brought it forward to this year in this situation. The reason they gave was astrological reason. Last Saturday, Modi marveled at the size of gathering that had attended his rally. And so we are where we are and the system has collapsed. Central government, as far as I'm concerned, has effectively left the people to the wolves from what I see. And I say this based on the activities I'm watching of activists, including turbine bug activists and artists who are now desperately rallying together on social media trying to organize resources for COVID, so oxygen, drugs, the cost of drugs are spiraling. This is a life and death situation. They've dropped their art, that's what they're doing now. Mm. Now, both governments of Bangladesh and India talk about development. That's what they call this development. And so this is what development looks like at the time when we most need the government. This is what development looks like. Now, Turbine Bug exists to think, to challenge, and to contest. It's a call to think, to challenge, and contest. And that extends to the UK and Western governments. So as diaspora, they represent us. Because the way I see it, these governments openly endorsed Hindutva fascism for so long, and they also endorse corporate fundamentalism around the world. So for all their rhetoric and attacks on so-called extremism and fundamentalism, the way I see it, they're perfectly comfortable with certain forms of fundamentalism. And so where that's brought us to now is actually a global hazard. This is not just an India issue. This virus is now thriving and mutating in a country of 1.3 billion, which is ostensibly the world's largest secular democracy. Um, I had to say this because I'm feeling the energy of what's going on with the artists that I work with there. And it just would not be right for me to just go into art without talking about this. Yes, but and now, we, we do yeah. appreciate you for bringing attention to this. Thank you. Okay. Mm. I'm now gonna go more into turbine bug and I'm gonna do that in the format of a photo story. So, <clears throat> oh, I need to share screen actually, hold on. Share screen. Can you see, can you see my screen now? Yes, we see it. Okay. Okay, um, sorry, I just need to get rid of this window that's saying you're sharing screen. I don't know how to minimize this because it's getting in the way of my text. Maybe I'll just exit full screen so I can read. Um, okay, I'm just gonna try. Unfortunately, this your sharing screen thing is coming in the way. Mm. Okay, in February 2018, mm. I, I bought a packet of samosa known as Shingara in Bangla on the streets of Dhaka, Bangladesh. The packet intrigued me. It was made from waste printouts of lists of court hearings, cases between citizens and the state. Entranced by this packet, I began to collect more, constructed from throwaway papers, letters, corporate emails, official documents, kids' homework, poems, news, and court lists. Collectively, they painted an insightful portrait of a country. In August 2018, my uncle, photographer and human rights activist, Shohidul Alum, was jailed by the government of Bangladesh after reporting on student protests.
I began making my own samosa packets, charting the stories of the free Shahidul movement that had spread across the globe. And somehow a samosa packet movement was born. I staged two free Shahidul protest exhibitions at Tate Modern Turbine Hall with Cuban performance artist and activist Tanya Bruguera. We showed Shahidul's crossfire series of photographs on extrajudicial killings in Bangladesh. In December 2019, India was in the grip of mass protests sparked by proposed citizenship laws seen to discriminate against Muslims. Citizens were revolting against fascism and the actions of the BJP, the Hindu nationalist ruling party led by Narendra Modi. Events in India are the latest wave of a hardline Hindu supremacist agenda and a wider project to create a Hindu nation based on Brahminical Hindutva ideology. We're now at a precipice. The world's largest secular democracy has turned into a fascist Hindu supremacist state with relative ease. That's ominous and should be a lesson to the world. Together with activists, I began organizing a joint artist peaceful protest at Tate Modern Museum in London. For a period of one day, the cathedral-like space of the Turbine Hall, one of the world's most prominent art spaces, would be our Shaheen Bag. Bag means garden. Our action was called Turbine Bag. We invited writers, poets, and thinkers from across the world to create samosa packets for Turbine Bag. They were printed on the back of waste printouts. There would be a large rice circle around which we would sing protest songs and read poems in solidarity with the mass resistance in India. The samosa packets would be displayed in the circle. After the event, we'd send them to Shaheen Bagh. Many artists began to contribute. Also filmmakers. poets, writers, and musicians too. Telling stories of resistance from many countries, from Nepal to Lebanon to the UK. We wanted to raise awareness Shaheen Bagh is the largest women's resistance movement of our time, yet many in the UK know little or nothing about it. Led mainly, but not only, by Muslim women, Shaheen Bagh challenges patriarchy, but it also challenges Western stereotypes. Certain strands of Western feminism present us as comparatively backward, repressed, invisible, unable to act without the agency of our men. And yet we have the women of Shaheen Bagh. There is no equivalent women's movement in the West that I can think of. It was important to highlight Western complicity. The UK government's endorsement of India's ruling party is problematic. Home Secretary Preeti Patel congratulated Modi's election victory in May 2019. Former leader Tony Blair, who waged a war on terror to free the world of religious fundamentalism, met Modi in October 2019, along with other architects of the Iraq war. We are witnessing a vast and historic civil rights resistance against fascism, Hindu nationalism, and corporate takeover of the world's largest secular democracy. Strong organization of women, a rallying together of religious minorities, the oppressed castes, farmers, laborers, indigenous peoples, environmental activists in their masses. 
This movement should be an inspiration to us all. By March 2020, coronavirus had extended its grip on the globe. Take modern clothes. Our event was postponed, but it didn't matter. Turbine Buck had become a movement. Grassroots in spirit, embracing emerging artists from India and beyond, it had also gathered support from figures including Sharon Stone, Anish Kapoor, Amitav Ghosh, and Vijay Prashad. The packets were in self-isolation in my studio in London, but the movement went on. Children also participated. My seven-year-old daughter made a packet for Bangladeshi photojournalist Gajul, who was disappeared on March the 10th. Gajul's son came across the post and reached out. Turbine bug artists began to help on the Where is Gajul campaign, a gesture of South Asia solidarity. Artists began making their own packets in Kashmir, Singapore, New York. The packets belong in the world where they can start conversations and tell stories. Please make your own, take the movement beyond museum walls. Um, so yeah, that's the story of Turbine Bug. And if I've got one minute or so, just to give you an idea of the kind of thing that we're up to now, I wanted to show a little clip. And it's a video of a protest that we were involved in in London, just around Christmas time. Um, and it's really to give viewers a sense of the kind of agitation that we are involved in as activists here in the UK. And I think for our friends in Bangladesh and India who are watching, it might be good to see what we're doing. So I'm just gonna show that. So this, was, this protest was arranged by activists in the UK, including South Asia Solidarity Group, who we work with quite a lot, and they're very long standing, standing committed activists that also fight against racism, imperialism, the war on terror here as well. So we had a little bus or they arranged a little bus that traveled around London and it had images of the farmers protests and love jihad laws that were going through at the time um, and the CAA laws. Today is International Human Rights Day. In India, Modi's government is violating human rights. It's one year since the Islamophobic CAA was passed. This violates India's secular constitution. The CAA, Citizen Amendment Act, is a way of targeting the whole Muslim population in India and potentially disenfranchises them. In other words, it's a pathway to ethnic cleansing. Love Jihad will be used to attack Muslim men and take away all freedom of choice from Hindu women. There have already been cases in UP would show the grotesque Islamophobia at work here. These two laws taken together are almost identical to Hitler's Nuremberg laws, which were passed in a prelude to the genocide. It's been a year of resistance in India, culminating in the mass protests of, by farmers against Modi's corporate takeover of agriculture. We stand in solidarity with all those resisting fascism in India. The world is watching. What they may think that Indians in the UK support him, but we're here to tell him that's not the case. And the numbers of people who are uniting against fascism in India is growing every day and everywhere. That's it. Um, thank you, Sophia, for that um, insightful and compelling story of how Turbine Bog started. Um, 
Learning more about the movement and the packets has been extremely inspiring to know that we can collectively make an impact. I wanted to shift to asking you some questions about where Turbine Bog is now, where it's going in terms of social issues it's bringing awareness to, and um, what are some collaborations with other artists and activists you've been able to do? Uh, my first question is about your background in architecture. How does your architecture practice inform Turbine Bog's visual blueprint and mobility? Does Turbine Bog resemble the laying down of a foundation to create a larger structural network in terms of mobilizing the masses on social justice issues? Okay. Um, I'm really glad that you've asked about architecture because architecture is a central part of my practice, which actually often gets overlooked by the work I do. Now, in terms of turbine bug, I'd say the most direct correlation uh, of ar my architecture practice and turbine bug is that as an architect, I'm used to working in teams. So as you know, architects are artists that work collaboratively. We all you know, we produce everything together. And so I've always been very comfortable working in teams. I like working in teams. And Turbine Bug is about working in teams and it's about us growing together as artists because the established art world is very much about the individual single artist growing to great heights. Mm -hmm. uh, and many don't really, it's not a sustainable model at all for most artists. And so um, for, for me, Turbine Bug is, I like to grow with other artists. But there's another aspect to um, architecture and my practice. And that is that, um, so Turbine Bug is about the art of dissent, effectively. And it platforms, I platform the work of other artists that are making art of dissent and they use various medium. So photography, illustration, video, whatever it is. Now for me, my medium of artistic expression for the art of dissent is still architecture and remains architecture. And so I work on really difficult cases and I'm very busy doing very pra practical stuff most of the day, not particularly creative. And I think it's in those rare moments where I actually get to do my architecture where I begin to process that in terms of artistic expression by which I mean I'm processing the things I've heard about, the things I've read about, the stories of prisoners that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm processing the emotional side of that and the trauma actually of dealing with that. And my art of descent mm -hmm. and language of art of descent is architecture. And I think the only way I can explain that to you is actually to show you something I'm working on at the moment. So I'm gonna try okay. to do that somehow to get this video. Um, so, I don't know, if, can you see this model? Yes. Okay. So for instance, this is something I'm, I'm working on at the moment. And, okay, now I think if I go take the screen down. Now, I don't know if you can see, but on this upper level, the walls are made with poems of Professor Sai Baba, who is jailed on life sentence in India. That wall drops like a curtain, but stops just above the floor level. And the reason for that is because people who are inside that box are to lie down on the floor. And when they lie down, they look out across the horizontal ground plane and see those flowers and that landscaping. And the reason they lie down is based on the lying positions of the prisoners in Amdani cell of Kerani Gonj jail that I studied and drew for a long time. Then if I come to the lower floor down, I don't know if you can see there, those orange flowers, and you probably can't yeah. see because there's not, can you see right on the other side, there's another layer of yellow flowers. Yes, so I can that, see them. Okay, so that lower level, the landscaping there is about creating an aura or a haze of yellow light. And that is based on Shujomuki cell, 
which is sunflower cell, which is the first cell that my uncle was detained in. Um, one last thing I'll show you. Okay, if I just very roughly put that there. Okay. On the elevation, there are penetrations or holes 10 inches diameter. That 10 inches relates to the 10 inches that the prisoners in Kerani Gonj jail, Amdani cell, each get when they lie spine to spine, packed in a very tight formation. In this building, that 10 inches hole translates to spots of light that disperse throughout the space. So I think, yeah, that's what I'm talking about with architecture as my language. That's, yeah, that's very interesting to see how this language of architecture informs your activism. Um, and going back to mobilizing the masses and connecting the diaspora on these issues, you know, through these packets, which are everyday objects that have now become mobilizers of justice and truth, um, they're also in some ways giving the public control of the narrative and letting the public create their own form of media. What role do you think artists can play in creating a participatory platform for exploring issues that those in power may try to suppress? Well, I think it's incredibly important that that happens now. It's become very easy to do that yeah. in some senses. I don't mean in terms of the risk, I mean in terms of the actual technical, because of social media, et cetera. But the reason it's very important to do that now, I think, is because journalism, uh, mainstream culture and mainstream media have largely abdicated their responsibilities to speak truth. Mm -hmm. because they've been co-opted very much by governments. Um, and so they no longer really exist to, to think and to challenge and, uh, anymore. They exist more to uphold an existing dominant social order and to maintain or serve the agenda of, of governments. And, and so it's really important now that I'm, to be honest, I think artists have always had that role. Yep. There's a very strong history of the art of dissent. And the art of dissent that I find the most interesting is not actually visual art, but music, jazz, poetry. Um, I don't know of any civil rights movement that didn't use the art yeah. of dissent. So it's always been there, but I think it's very urgent now and it, it's needed. And what's more needed is for us to support those artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... That's interesting that you bring um, music and other forms of art into it too. And I think it's been very um, inspiring to see a new form with these packets being able to do the same thing that um, other forms of art have done in the past. And, you know, I've read that the ability of artists to create worlds and move people is what makes art so powerful has a form of activism. Can you speak a little bit about how you combined art and activism to generate action? What effect do you see this have on the public? What effect do I see? Um, I would say two things about that. Um, the first is what encourages me most is when I get messages from people who are not even artists or activists, and particularly when they're not South Asian, by which I mean messages such as ones that I get from mothers in Ireland or mothers in Italy or mothers in the UK that say, um, my eyes have opened now and I've become aware of these issues and I, I now follow it. Um, and interestingly, a number of artists who are not political artists in any way um, from across the world are now helping us and making work on those campaigns and they're suddenly really engaged in Bangladesh and Indian politics. So I've been calling them honorary Bangladeshis because I was like, you guys are more engaged than the diaspora in, in our current politics. Um, the other thing is, the other messages that mean a lot to me, so, 
sometimes it does feel disheartening as if this is really get going nowhere. So I'll make a samosa packet on Ruhul Amin, who was jailed in Bangladesh. He's now out on bail. I made I make a packet on him. I post it. Nobody shares it. Very few share it. One or two. Mm -hmm. There hardly any likes. And then I think, what, what can I do? What can I do? This is life or death. It's not going anywhere. And then I'll get a direct message from someone um, who is related to one of the people that we're campaigning for. And they're very quiet. They don't really tell me their identity because it's also risky for them. Mm -hmm. They hold back, but they've quietly given me a message that they're seeing what you're doing it means a lot to us. It's what we want. Please keep going. And um, I get that message. And then I go back to work making things that no one will share. Um, we actually have a question um, from Shahid Al Alam, and I think it might add to our conversation right now. He asks, what effect has this had on your children? It's had a huge effect on my children. Um, I said in an article once that children are my favorite allies and it's because many adults have a problem with what I do for, for, for many reasons they don't like what I do and when we were doing campaigns like the Free Shohidul campaign they would throw cold water on all the big mm. ideas we had say so it's not going to get anywhere you're fighting a losing battle the kids never ever had that they were always up for it so quite quickly and quite early on I began to work with them because they actually motivated me kept me going they didn't think I was crazy I had a good time with them yeah and this kept going so you know through lockdown I was supposed to be doing homeschooling it was difficult I was had my own work what could I do so I started to involve them in my own work. Yeah. So you saw the gradual package. Yes. And so there's no doubt that that affects their way of seeing the world, their view of prisoners, their view of what mm. morals, um, their view of injustice. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, been like mixed emotions to see kids involved in these social justice issues, right? Part of me feels like, they should be sheltered from that and they should be enjoying their childhood but then it's also very powerful to see them have a voice and have opinions and get involved from such a young age and I was just going to bring up um, the Wears Gajal packet that you had mentioned that your daughter had created and I think it's um, great that she sees her mother doing something so impactful and she felt that she needed to also um, be part of it. Um, so my next question, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, is oh, okay. the kids are amazingly resilient. So they, yes. they don't actually get that upset. They just yeah. turn to action and they don't think anything's mm -hmm. impossible. So they just try stuff. And in fact, they quite enjoy the action. Yeah. Uh, my, my son wrote a letter to the jailed activist, Dr. Anand Del Dumde um, in India and that ended up being published in the BBC. And so, you know, that was great for him. And they're very resilient. They actually enjoy it. Yeah, great. Um, so that actually brings me to my next question. Do you consider the Turbine Bog project revolutionary in that it is committed to transforming the way the public holds those in power accountable? Um, I'm also really curious to know what are some new transformed worlds that you are dreaming of? Um, so revolutionary, I think turbine bug and activism are about a way of living and a way to live. And that's also about changing yourself. And it's to do with a choice of life of how you choose to live whether you choose to live in this world, just accepting injustice, getting what you can, accept taking the perks that you get from it and really shutting your eyes. Because I think to continue to live like that, you actually have yeah. to live your life eyes half closed. And so 
And for a long time, I did that too. I didn't engage and I don't, I think I was half dead. And so revolution comes, came for me when I began to change. That was for me revolution. And then if through turbine bug, any of these people that I speak to also begin to think about the way they live and yeah. what they want to spend their life doing, that for me is revolution. And in terms of other worlds, I think I just want a world where I'm fighting for a world where the people that I'm fighting for get to live the life that I want, that you want, that I would want for my children. Nothing more, nothing less. They're just humans. They just, you know, whether it's indigenous rights or prisoners rights or um, the oppressed castes or persecuted religions and minorities, they don't actually want anything. They just want to be left alone to live a life of dignity. Yeah. And that's what that imagined world is. Yeah, I think oftentimes people tend to see arts praxis as a mode of doing rather than a mode of being. And it's so important to embody mm -hmm. the values that you're, you know, you're out preaching to live that life every day and to be that in what you're doing. Um, so thank you for that. You know, and it's interesting to see that the power that these packets hold now, um, while they may not be, or they're not meant to be fine art the way that we understand institutional art to be, they have become a vehicle for justice, a form of rebellion, and they're giving a voice to the silenced through visual art. Um, they depart from or challenge conventional institutional affiliations. Since Turbine Bog has and will, and will eventually be archived or displayed in various institutions and museums, how has it been challenging for you, um, or has it been challenging or in embracing the institutional affiliation? Um, it actually wasn't challenging because a precedent was set with the free Shahidul protest where we just walked in and did it and did what the hell we wanted. Yeah. There was no curator involved, nothing. And we had full agency and I have to be grateful to the museum, they didn't stop us. They must have told the security guards, don't, mm. don't obstruct them, let them do it. And then when I planned the turbine bug, again, I said to the museum that we're gonna keep this really separate. So you do not need to be involved in any way. The turbine hall is a civic space. Mm -hmm and it should be used by the public as a civic space. And we've seen that Extinction Rebellion and things have, have had protests and we would like to occupy the civic space of the Turbine Hall. You can stand back, you have your politics, we have ours. And so that's what we planned. And I think that's a really interesting way of working with museums because museums also now need to find a way to be more than just a marketplace for mega bucks are. They're also trying to grapple with their yeah. quite bad image. And I find, um, you know, they, ha they have these yeah. fast dead spaces. And I think that's a really good way to use them. Yes, um, definitely agree with all that. Um, for my last question, I kind of wanted to take, to take it to the beginning where um, you know, the turbine bog movement started with your uncle Shadal Alam, so obviously it's very close to home for you. Uh, what do you think is the ethical responsibility of the artist in representing these voices and their struggles? What are some roadblocks or challenges you've faced in some of these campaigns? And is there always a pressure to generate impact? Mm. Yeah, I had to think about this question and I wanted to take it from a slightly deeper place because when we talk about the kind of challenges of activism and uh, the dangers and risks um, we often talk about you know incarceration repression and, and that's important and we need to talk about those but there's another side um, being an activist can be very very lonely hmm. although you work with groups and collaboratively Ultimately, it can be very lonely. Hmm. You can be punished for it 
not only by the state, but by your friends and family. And that is because, coming back to what we were saying earlier, what, what you're doing is you're choosing a life that really tries to live with one's eyes fully open. And when you choose that life or that life, the choice of that life, society actually finds extremely offensive mm -hmm. on multiple levels for many reasons. I think one reason is sometimes people feel guilt that you've chosen this life and they feel guilt as if you're showing them up for not choosing that life. Um, and there are other reasons, but many will stand by you and many won't. And then there are others who are initially very seduced by the passion yeah. and then slowly they fall away. They don't stay the course. Um, I could not have sustained Turbine Bug or my wider work without the intense love, and I use that word love very specifically, yeah. with the, without the intense love of my husband, my children, my family, and those fellow artists and activists who stayed the course and continue to stand by me and didn't fall away. Uh, they embraced my choice, they live with it day in, day out, and, and it's yeah. not always easy, it really isn't. Yeah. Um, but I've seen many activists experience the opposite, and I think that's what breaks them. So of all the risks and dangers and obstacles, and there are the big obvious ones like jail and whatever, we're all human and we need love and support from the people around us. And that choice in life often means the destruction of that love and the loss of that love. And I think that's the highest price that an activist pays very yeah. often that's beautiful thank you for sharing that and being so open about it i think we do tend to overlook that activists and artists are also people and there's so much emotion behind what you know we do um, and it's important to have the support of the people around us um, this brings me into some of the questions our audience has been asking. And again, please feel free to ask your question in the Q&A box. Our first question is from Shireen. Um, she, she would like to know, what actually awakened your activist spirit? The jailing of my uncle. So that was a very pivotal moment in your life, obviously. And Absolutely. Yeah. I think everything changed that night when he was abducted, August the 5th. It's yeah. a sh shift in my life shift in my yeah. life, the way I live, and also my art and architecture in the way I see space. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes, yeah, we see things on TV, but when it happens to someone you know or someone close to you is how we're prompted to really act. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Our next question is from Shaheen. She wants to know, what sort of response have you had from the mainstream art organizations um, for example, the British Museum, as well as the gov uh, UK government? Mm, I haven't had any response from the British Museum, but I'm frankly, they probably aren't even aware of what I do. Um, I was very pleased that Turbine Bag was nominated for the Jamil Prize and will therefore be exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, because it's very important for us to reach these audiences where we operate within activist circles and, and that's great. And you know, the most interesting art happens outside white cube spaces, but we do need to reach these audiences because they revolve in the circles that control the levers of power. Um, what I where I haven't had any interest that I can think of is from the art establishment of Bangladesh and India. None of them have come and said that they'd like to see the work or show the work. Um, I'm sure with this, you know, activist art, it tends to generate its own um, uh, momentum inside the institutional world. So I think it's just a matter of time where everyone's gonna be knocking on your door. Um, so we have another question from Reka, who's actually asking, has a film been made on this topic? No, no film's been made. 
that would be a very interesting documentary, I think, um, topic for someone to take on. Um, Shahidul Alam would like to know, will you talk about your decision to give up your career as an architect and take on the more risky option of a freelance artist, especially late in your career? Mm. So when I wanted to take that decision, the first person I went to see, and he'll remember, is Mama. He was at my mum's house packing a suitcase. Yeah. And the reason I took, went to see him is because I knew everyone else might throw caution on it or throw cold water, and he would tell me to do it. <laughs> so yeah. I went and I said, shall I just throw it all in and try and do my own thing? And he said, you only have one life, and it's irresponsible to not leave your life in the way that you can live it best. And I just thought I have to do it and I did it and it's been three years and I don't regret it at all. Okay. Um, Marasa would like to know, uh, they said, thanks for sharing, great work. I really like the 10 inch hole project and the light that came through it for the prisoners. Have you considered working with light has medium and the same idea of 10 inch holes? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, how does light play into this? So, so, so could you repeat the last bit of the question? Yes, it's have you considered working with light has medium and the same idea of 10 inch holes? So light, light is a medium and 10 yes. Um, yes, but I, I do that really through architecture now. So I'm the buildings I design, that's where I explore light. Uh, so that's what that was, what, what, what okay. I was showing you. That was a wall in which there are 10 inch hole penetrations. Um, it's a southwest facing wall. And so at a certain time, the sun comes round and disperses light into the volume of the space. And, and the building is nothing to do, it's not a prison. I, I, I can't say what the building yeah. is, it's a confidential thing. But the the functions of the buildings where I explore these ideas could be anything. It mm. could be a school, it could be a hospital. Um, that's what my architecture of disappearance is about. Okay, great. Um, it'd be interesting to see how you play with light once um, the packets do end up inside an institution or a museum, right? Like that would be kind of interesting to see um, the light play and just the way they're displayed also. Well, that's a good point because um my first fascination with those packets was way before Shahidul went to jail or anything yeah. else how they interacted with daylight and I photographed them a lot with natural light and light, light coming through them and um that's how I tend to photograph them in the VNA it's an indoor space with no natural light and I'm quite curious to see what light yeah. can be so this last question by Ridwan actually takes us to kind of our next um activity, um, how can those of us in the US or anywhere else for that matter, support Turbine Bog? Um, so Sophie and I would actually like to invite everyone to participate in creating their own packets. And Sophia, did you wanna talk more about this activity? And I can kind of share through the chat as to how people can get involved. Yeah, so what I've loved best is when artists have been making, or non-artists, anyone can make them, um, they're not originally made by artists, uh, have been making their own packets wherever they live, expressing whatever they like. I mean, some artists didn't do anything political on their packet, and that, that's fine. And so um, I'd really love it if, you know, I also made some which I used for my kids' pack lunch, so I did one on Angela Davis and my, my daughter yeah. took her, her pack lunched it. So you can use them for, for various things. And I know other artists have used them as pencil pots or whatever. Um, so I'd love it if you guys could make packets of your own about your own thing and then just post it or send it to me or post it with hashtag turbine bug so that we can share. Yes, and please um, do share that with SAI as well on our Instagram page at SAI underscore Chicago. We would love to share that on our page. Uh, we do have just uh, two more questions that I think would be interesting. Shreen would like to know, do you know how many packets have been created to date? Mm, I've created, or in my possession, there are about uh, 120 
and then some have been created by artists themselves so I don't know okay and Shaheen um is saying Sophia you're such an inspiration as a person and your art practice and activism how have you been received do you have to overlook many negative approaches or dismiss take or dismissive takes on your amazing forthright pioneering work? Um, I don't get so much negative feedback on the work, but initially I did get hostility about my choice to pursue activism. Um, some, yeah, were not very pleased about it. Some questioned, whether I was paying enough attention to my children. Um, some said I was neglecting my children. Uh, but as I said, my children never said that and they just did the work with me. Great, um, if there's no more questions at this point, I would like the audience for tuning in and being part of our discussion and a huge thank you to Sophia for um, sharing your story of Turbine Bog with us. It's been such a pleasure to learn more about your work and have you be part of Diasporic Rhizome. Thank I you. think for me, myself especially, um, you know, producing something like Diasporic Rhizome has really opened my eyes to what other South Asian artists around the world are working on and the issues that they're bringing attention to. Um, please feel free to visit our virtual exhibition, Diasporic Rhizome, um, it will be up through May 15th, and uh, we're also happy to announce that we have an upcoming exhibition that will debut um, specifically at South Asia Institute on June 10th called The Sindhu Project, which um, is all new contemporary art created by two artists, Mavish Chisti and Gunjan Kumar. So if you are ever in Chicago, we would love to have you. Um, other than that, thank you everyone for being here with us. And um, we are so glad that you could join us today. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thanks for showing the work. Thank you.